Okay, welcome everyone. Hello, Mark. All right, good morning, Hugh. Hi. Hi. Let me get my sound up here. Okay, so you're all set to be a co-host? Yes. Okay, good. You okay with turning your camera on too? Oh yeah. Uh, let's see here. There we go. You don't mind Hawaii, do you? Well, I assume you're not actually in Hawaii or did your vacation happen or not? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> not till the 15th. Okay. I, I think I'm still here next Sunday too. Okay, good. Yeah. Although I'm getting tan just working in the yard. You can see that. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I'm not getting much of one because I've been locked up uh, trying to uh, do edits on my next book. Huh. You tell me when to start and I'll... Continue. No, no, we're, we're all, we're already going. We got, uh, you know, uh, 17, 19 people involved. So, okay. uh, yeah, okay. first 15 minutes, we'll take Q&A and then I'll take over. So, all right. Well, good morning, everybody. This is uh, Mark Durham. I'm standing in for uh, Jamie and Mark Perez and Ross Hoagland. And uh, probably be here next week, too. So I'll uh, host the questions this morning to you. And uh, we'll do 15 minutes of Q&A, then a half hour of a uh, lesson, then a little more Q&A to about noon. And then we'll jump into the web meeting at that point. So uh, go ahead and get your question. I've got some questions from last week still. Can you hear me? Let's start with those. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah. Even Pasta. We're told that about one third of the created angels rebelled against God and were expelled from heaven. The two thirds that did not rebel are still based in heaven. Are those good angels perfect creatures in that they've never sinned? Yeah, short answer is yes. Uh, they are righteous angels. They have never sinned. And uh, because angels don't experience physical death like we do, uh, when they sin, uh, their sin is permanent. Uh, there isn't a pathway for redemption like there is for us human beings. But the righteous angels, as it tells us in the uh, New Testament epistles, uh, God uses them to assist us in our ministry here on earth to bring people to faith in Christ and to bring them into uh, you know, Christ-like uh, living. It says in Hebrews 13 too, many of us have entertained angels unawares. Unawares because they have the power to appear to us uh, in human form. So yeah, uh, occasionally, just like you see in the book of Acts, uh, people appear, they're not really human, they're actually angels and uh, they come and go. Uh, they're there to assist us when we need the assistance. Uh, Jamie had a follow-up question on that, and that is, those uh, so-called fallen angels, where are they now? I, they, I mean, they don't get uh, kicked out of heaven down to earth until the mid-tribulation period, I believe. So where are they? Where's their abode right at, at this time? Yeah, well, there will come a time when they all get kicked out. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to be facing an onslaught of these fallen angels here on earth. Uh, but there are some fallen angels here on earth right now, just that they're not all here, uh, but some are here. And, uh, you know, Jesus encountered them in his uh, ministry here on earth, and the people around the world encounter them too. Uh, but they can only uh, invade our lives or harass us or possess us if we humans give them permission. They need permission. And uh, it also tells us in scripture that once a human being dedicates their life to Jesus Christ, makes Jesus their creator, Lord, and savior, they cannot be possessed by a fallen angels. They are protected from that. 
However, it doesn't mean that a Christian can't be harassed uh, by a fallen angel. And, uh, you know, I can tell you stories, and uh, we got some in, uh, in, in our book, A Lights the Sky, Little Green Men, uh, where these fallen angels, when they see a Christian threatening their territory, threatening their influence over a non-Christian, they'll attempt to scare away uh, that non-Christian. And so uh, uh, there have been instances. I've seen this myself when I've been in places uh, here in America and particularly in other countries uh, where people are possessed by demons, uh, where the demon uh, takes considerable effort to try to scare you off. And my advice there is when you see that happening, rejoice, because it means you're having an impact uh, on that non-Christian uh, who's being possessed uh, or harassed uh, by a fallen angel. The demon wouldn't be trying to scare you off unless that demon was being threatened uh, by your ministry. So it's actually a sign that you're having success. And uh, you know, once you start rejoicing uh, that success, uh, the demon runs away. Uh, well, most often they'll run away because the last thing they want to see is uh, Jesus Christ getting glory and getting credit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Susan Lambeau, Oh, would it almost be impossible to move out of a language point or Lagrange point, excuse me? Lagrange point. Because of the gravitational pull. Yeah, Lagrange point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm impressed that she knows what a Lagrange point is. Yeah. Uh, it refers to positions along the orbit of a body, about another body, uh, where a second body can share that orbit and uh, where that uh, position is reasonably stable in that orbit. Probably the most famous example of that uh, would be the Trojan asteroids. Uh, these are asteroids that share Jupiter's orbit around the sun. And because those asteroids are at one of the Lagrange points, uh, those asteroids can stay there uh, for a significant period of time. Now, yeah, if you've got a two body situation, say you've got a a planet orbiting a star, and there's no other planets in the, in the system, uh, then a second planet or an asteroid could sit at one of the Lagrange points and it would be stable for billions of years. Uh, but what happens, for example, to some of the Trojan asteroids uh, that are accompanying Jupiter in its orbit is they experience small gravitational uh, perturbations from Saturn, Neptune, uh, from Uranus, and uh, those perturbations will actually move the asteroid far enough away from the Lagrange point uh, that their orbit no longer is stable, and then that asteroid can move into a different orbit. Uh, so, and to give an example, I mean, I think we talked last week how astronomers are going to be putting the uh, James Webb Space Telescope at one of the Lagrange points in Earth's orbit. And the whole idea is that it'll be stable in that position for many, many years. And because the uh, James Webb Space Telescope is a low mass body, uh, chances are it's gonna be stable for a long time because the earth is uh, quite close to the sun and far away uh, from Venus and the Jupiter. Venus and Jupiter would be the two bodies that the biggest influence on uh, disturbing the position of the orbit of the James Webb Telescope, uh, but they're far enough away and sufficiently lacking in mass uh, that astronomers are confident that that James Webb Telescope is not going to be pushed out of its Lagrange point uh, for many, many decades, even centuries. That's one reason why they put it there saying, hey, we know we're not going to be able to send any mission up there to correct its orbit, but if we put a Lagrange point, we won't have to worry about it. Okay. Uh, Doug McComb, uh, can, how can heat exist before the formation of atoms? And he goes on, was there visible light before the creation of atoms? Uh, and, well, we just can't see visible light currently with our current telescopes, question mark. Yeah, good question. The light does come before atoms. I mean, in order to get atoms, the universe has to expand sufficiently and therefore cool down enough that electrons can attach to nuclei and begin to orbit them. Uh, kind of what we all learned in our chemistry classes. 
uh, that if you got a really high temperature, uh, then it's not possible for the electrons to have stable orbits about the nuclei. And this is what's referred to as the ionization epoch of the early universe, uh, where you don't have atoms. And so uh, the universe has to expand sufficiently uh, that electrons can now begin to orbit about the atoms. So light does predate that. In fact, light actually predates the formation uh, even of the protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons don't show up until about uh, 10 to the minus 11 seconds after the cosmic creation event. And light actually appears at about 10 to the minus 36 seconds. Uh, so the light comes first, uh, the, then you get the uh, quarks coming, and then you get the protons and neutrons, and quite a bit thereafter, you get atoms. Say, so when do atoms show up? They show up about 375,000 to 380,000 years after the cosmic creation event. It takes that long for the universe to cool enough uh, where atoms can begin to form. And if Doug's got a follow-up question, I'll be happy to take it. Um, well, Keith Wilson, how did the three other rocky planets turn out so different from each other? Two are without atmospheres, but Venus has such a dense atmosphere. Yeah, I'm actually, that'll all be in the, the book that I'm bringing out uh, in 2022. Uh, the book has now got a firm title. It's called Design to the Core. And I got two chapters in the book, chapters 10 and 11, that deal with planets both in our solar system and outside our solar system. And you'll actually find an article on our website. It's a, a blog I wrote at Today's New Reason to Believe blog, uh, where I talk about uh, the unique features of the solar system where the sun uh, was able to transfer a lot of refractive elements and a lot of angular momentum, and uh, therefore unique to the solar system are four rocky planets that are dense, a lot of the metals in them, and orbit far away from the star. Uh, I just did an update uh, on the uh, book uh, yesterday. I'll be doing some more updates today because uh, they've discovered a thousand new exoplanets since I first crafted those chapters almost a year ago. So I've gotten permission to update those chapters and include the new material. Uh, but as of yesterday, 286 planets have been discovered that fall within 20% of Earth's radius or within 20% of Earth's mass. But they all orbit their stars really closely. Only two orbit their stars at distances greater than 20% of the distance Earth orbits the sun. And the most distant one is orbiting at 43%. And it's not really an Earth-like planet. It's 40% uh, more massive, 44% more massive uh, than the Earth. So the vast majority are orbiting less than 10% Earth's distance from the sun. And that's because it takes exquisite fine tuning for a star like the sun to export all that angular momentum and those refractive elements uh, that make up the rocky planets. And so we've yet to discover a rocky planet that's anything like Mercury, Venus, Earth, uh, or Mars. And uh, the question is, why does uh, Venus uh, have a thick atmosphere? Well, as I'll describe in uh, Design to the Core, what determines how thick an atmosphere a planet possesses is, uh, number one, it's uh, gravity, its mass, and its density. And so the more mass of the planet, the denser the planet, the higher the probability it will accumulate uh, volatiles, gases, and liquids uh, to itself. And the more distant it is from its host star, the more of these liquids and gases it will accumulate. And I think uh, there's uh, obvious reasons for that. The more mass of the planet, the greater the gravity will have. And so it's going to be able to attract more material to it. And the more distant it is from its star, the cooler it will be. And it's heat that causes the evaporation of these volatiles. And so the colder the planet, uh, the higher the probability it will accumulate uh, gases and liquids to it. And uh, so for that reason, uh, we would not expect Mercury to have an ocean 
uh, or much of an atmosphere. It's too close to its host star and it doesn't have much mass. And so uh, Mercury has a thin argon atmosphere. So it's lost all of its water, it's lost its uh, carbon monoxide methane. It simply doesn't have the gravity to retain it and is way too hot. Uh, Venus, on the other hand, is significantly more massive than Mercury and significantly farther away. Therefore, it has a relatively thick atmosphere. You say, what about Mars? Mars has a thin atmosphere, uh, quite a bit thinner than the Earth's and certainly thinner than Venus's. And the reason why it doesn't have much of an atmosphere and no surface water is because it's just not ma that massive. Yeah, it's far away from the sun, but it's gravity. It's only got one ninth uh, the mass that the Earth has. And uh, at one ninth is simply not massive enough to be able to retain much. The one that doesn't fit is planet Earth. Earth should have an atmosphere that's about three times thicker than that of Venus, given how far away the Earth is and how much more massive the Earth is in Venus. And so Earth is the outlier. Uh, everything else fits. And by the way, when we look at exoplanets, they all fit these rules too. The more distant they are from their host stars, the thicker the atmosphere. The more massive the planets, the thicker the atmosphere. The only planet we've found out of the 4,900 that have been discovered to date is planet Earth. It's the one that doesn't fit. And the reason why it doesn't fit is that there were actually five rocky planets in the solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and the planet Thea. And Thea shared an orbit that was either uh, in Earth's orbit, might've been at one of those Lagrange points we talked about, or is very close to Earth's orbit. Uh, but what happened was, there was a collision or merger event uh, between Thea and the proto-Earth. So two rocky planets uh, merged together to form a bigger planet, planet Earth. And it was that merging event that eradicated almost the totality of Earth's orbit and Earth's water. To give you an idea, Earth began with an atmosphere about two to 250 times thicker uh, than it is today. And it began with an ocean uh, that was thousands of kilometers deep. Uh, the oceans today, they come in at about six kilometers deep. Uh, before that uh, collision with the planet Thea, uh, Earth's oceans were over a thousand kilometers deep. Uh, but the merger event basically blasted away all that water and that atmosphere to outer space. And it was later that Earth accumulated a thin atmosphere and a thin layer of water. But that's what's necessary for advanced life. You want a planet as massive as the Earth orbiting as distantly from the sun as it is in order to avoid tidal locking, in order to avoid deadly uh, flares from the sun. Uh, but you also want it to have a thin atmosphere and a thin layer of water. Those are requirements for advanced life. And incidentally, that's just three of over 500 characteristics of our planet Earth that have been fine-tuned to make our existence possible. Okay. Hugh, it's uh, 1049. It's okay. Uh, Hugh, uh, never too late, but can you say a short prayer for us? Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. And uh, Lord, uh, every day you give us is a blessing. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would encourage each of us to use the uh, short time that you give us uh, to be a blessing unto you and to be a blessing unto human beings, a blessing unto all life here on planet earth. So father, this day, I would ask that you would endow each of us uh, with your love, life, and truth. Lord, that uh, we may learn more about you and what you've done. And uh, father, uh, we may gain greater confidence, what we see revealed to us in the Bible. And father, may this encourage us to be uh, more Christ-like in our character and our dealings with one another in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, with that, let me uh, share screen so that you can all see my visuals. Here we go. All right, that's my first slide. It's the first slide you see every week. And just letting you know, if you've got questions, I do take questions here in Paradoxes, but I also take questions on my Facebook and Twitter page. And hey, if you're not already a subscriber, 
uh, join the Reasons to Believe YouTube channel. You can subscribe for free and literally on a daily basis, we're putting new video clips up there. And uh, this is a book I wrote, gee, a decade ago on dual revelation, more than a theory. You can get a free chapter of this book at reasons.org slash Ross. But as I've been telling you in these past few weeks, I'm currently working on a book that's going to come out after my next book. My next book is designed to the core. It's a fine tuning book, but the book I've been commissioned to write thereafter is basically uh, a lot of what we're talking about in the class. It's a book on dual revelation. And uh, so a lot of the content we're hearing, because it's, as I mentioned, this doctrine of dual revelation is being challenged uh, like never before. And uh, there really is a need uh, for a new book simply because there are new challenges that, that we are uh, facing. So uh, you can uh, also get this DVD, Dual Revelation, that we produced several years ago. And uh, when we uh, get done with our second Q&A time after the teaching, I'm going to open up a web meeting. This is the URL that you'll need uh, for the web uh, meeting. And uh, we're going to do uh, something uh, different. And uh, we're going to try to apply what we're learning the class. And so what we're going to do in the web meeting where we all turn our cameras and microphones on, we engage one another, kind of a fellowship time where we get to know one another, but it's also time to put into practice what we're learning. And the role play is uh, you happen to go to the water cooler or the breakout room or the lunch room, and you overhear a conversation between a couple of employees. And the conversation is kind of like, well, how can anyone uh, believe in a book uh, that teaches that there's a metal dome over a flat earth? And you've got a few minutes to respond. So uh, we'll be talking about that in the class today. And I did not have a scientific discovery for today. Last week, we talked about the uh, new discovery about uh, measuring the date of the cosmic dawn. And I think a lot of you will enjoy this. I got a, a message on my Facebook page uh, from someone who read the article I wrote on the cosmic dawn and uh, basically said, years ago, I dated a girl uh, by the name of Cosmic Dawn, the greatest mistake of my life. I wasn't aware that people actually named their daughters Cosmic Dawn. Uh, so, but the dawn we talked about last week uh, was the, uh, the beginning of the first stars that show up in the universe. If you missed last week, it is recorded and you can uh, download the recording for free at paradoxes.org. Uh, but I didn't want to do a scientific discovery uh, today. I'll do one next week. Uh, for the simple reason I want us to make some significant headway in our subject on how do you respond uh, to accommodationism. Accommodationism has been with us uh, for centuries, uh, but there's a new accommodationism uh, that uh, came up, and it really goes back uh, to uh, 2008, and it was the uh, theologian Kenton Sparks who wrote a book on accommodationism, introduced a new concept of accommodationism. And I briefly discussed this last week, but uh, this is the first and most complete definition. He's got a whole book on this, God's words and human words, uh, where he basically talks about this accommodationist uh, theology. And uh, Kenton Sparks, if you're wondering, he, he and Peter Enns uh, were the two theologians uh, that uh, worked with um, uh, that, that were part of the launch of, uh, with Francis Collins of uh, BioLogos. Uh, they were the two theologians of partner with. They're no longer with BioLogos. Uh, BioLogos scientists have felt that uh, the movement of sparks and ends towards more liberal theology is something they didn't want any longer to encourage. Uh, sparks and uh, ends are still writing books and articles. Uh, but yeah, back in 2008, this was the definition that the Sparks gave. Accommodationism is God's adoption in inscripturation, in other words, the forming of scripture of the human audience's finite and fallen perspective. Its underlying conceptual assumption is that in many cases, God does not correct our mistaken human viewpoints, but merely assumes them in order to communicate with us. In other words, Sparks and later ends 
came up with this idea uh, that particularly in the Old Testament, uh, when the Holy Spirit partners with the human authors of the Old Testament books, uh, God does not take the time or the effort to correct the mistaken human uh, viewpoints, the viewpoints of the human author, uh, and mainly because God has a greater goal, a desire to communicate uh, with that generation, and uh, rather than correcting their mistaken ideas, simply tolerates their mistakes in order to communicate a more important point. Uh, Sparks and Ends argue that if God actually went to the point of correcting all their mistaken scientific ideas, uh, that the readers of the Old Testament uh, would be focusing on the corrections and not on the more important theological point. And you know, I can sympathize with the motivation of Sparks and Ends uh, that we wanna ensure that people reading the Bible are getting the main points. Uh, but it does raise the problem of the Bible no longer uh, being inerrant in everything it communicates. Although Sparks and Peter Enns would say, the Bible is definitely inerrant when it speaks about faith, practice, and doctrine, you know, the important theological issues, but uh, we shouldn't expect it to be inerrant when it's addressing matters of science, uh, history, uh, or geography. So this is where it uh, goes back to. Um, and this is a quote from page 241 of Kenton Sparks' book. Baker brought it out in the 2008. And uh, this led to a number of other uh, theologians, conservative theologians, picking up on this idea and trying to explain why it is that there's all these mistaken, mistaken viewpoints that come into scripture. Uh, from their perspective. So for example, uh, John Walton, uh, another theologian and archeologist brought out a book, The Lost World of uh, Genesis 1, uh, but he followed that up with another book, The Lost World of Scripture that he co-authored uh, with the uh, theologian Brent Sandy. And this is what they wrote in that book. They said, people in the ancient world were aware of the material world, but they didn't care a whole lot about it. And they didn't prioritize exploration of it. So he's basically making the point, Walton and Brent Sandy, that people that were the contemporaries of the ancient Israelites uh, really didn't care about science and didn't prioritize it. They didn't invest in science. They were aware there was a material world, but that's where their interests uh, ended. And they go on to say in the same book uh, that to the ancients, geology, hydrology, and chemistry uh, were unknown. Well, I think I would agree with them that the ancients weren't all that concerned about balancing uh, the valences in their chemistry equations. But to say that they were uh, completely ignorant about chemistry uh, or geology or hydrology, I mean, again, as a scientist, and this is what that concerns me too. These claims that the ancients were scientifically ignorant and cared nothing about science and knew nothing really about the material world other than existed. These are statements <coughs> coming from theologians that are not trained in the sciences. I mean, those of us that are trained in the sciences do recognize as we study the history of science that the ancients we're just as interested in geology, hydrology, and chemistry as we are. They were involved in chemistry. Uh, there was a, uh, an enterprise. There was an income to be made. And uh, I think it's, it's well established, for example, that the ancients were employing chemistry to come up with different dyes and inks as one example. Uh, so, uh, and they were aware, for example, of, uh, uh, you know, alloys that you can make and ways that you could use chemistry uh, to affect uh, different metals and uh, hydrology. I mean, this is what I find really interesting is that you got Walton and Brent Sandy, Peter Enns, uh, you know, Sparks and others. Um, you know, you got people like Tremper Longman III, uh, all making the point uh, that the ancients uh, didn't care about any of this, had no knowledge of this. And yet these are the civilizations, especially what you see in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, 
uh, who were very involved in agriculture. And because Egypt is a desert and Mesopotamia is a desert, they had to get their water from the rivers flowing through the land. And so they used the Nile, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and they figured out how to pump water out of the rivers to irrigate their fields. And so they were very familiar, for example, with Archimedes principle, you know, the kind of tools you needed to be able to vertically lift water out of a river and distribute it uh, through these ditches throughout your agricultural fields and grow a huge quantity of food. And they recognized, for example, that there was a limit uh, to how much water uh, you could bring up to a certain height. And how, uh, there's a height issue and there's a volume issue. This is significant because this alone refutes this myth that pervades uh, conservative Christian theology today, that the ancients, including the Israelites, believed in a flat earth uh, with a solid or a metal dome above the earth where there was water above that dome uh, with little gates that were opened up uh, by the gods so that water in, that's where rainfall comes from. The ancients knew the principle of Archimedes and recognized that it was utterly absurd to think about water existing above a metal dome. There's no way to get liquid water up to that height at, at that volume uh, level. And then I think what really got me as an astrophysicist is this statement on uh, page uh, 52 of uh, the book by uh, Walton and Brent Sandy, where they said, and incidentally, this is repeated uh, many times throughout the book, science is always changing because science is always changing. It's not a trustworthy uh, source of truth. And they give the example that who knows, 100 years from now, the Big Bang Theory could be replaced by a completely different uh, cosmic model. So they're basically uh, positing this point. And I find them repeating something that I heard in the young earth community uh, for decades is this idea, everything in science uh, is subject to change. It's all up for grabs. Uh, but again, anyone who is a student of the history of science recognizes this is not true. The ancients recognize that this is not true. You know, a statement that you hear amongst uh, scientists, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And a good example of that is physicists today saying, we stand on the shoulders of Isaac Newton. We stand on the shoulders of James Clark Maxwell. These are scientists of the past that laid a foundation of unchanging science that we can use to advance science we don't yet have understanding. And so this idea that science is always changing, the scientific community understands Newton's laws of physics. Uh, they're, 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 they're sound, they're not changing. We observe them operating all over the universe. Uh, it is true that general relativity makes a minor correction or adjustment or refinement to Newton's laws, but the refinement is often uh, 12, 15 places of the decimal. You gotta be moving at really high velocities before you need to make any adjustments to Newton's laws of motion. So for example, uh, when we send spacecraft to the distant planets, yes, we're sending them out at 25,000 miles per hour. However, that velocity is so tiny compared to the, <coughs> excuse me, the velocity of light that the relativistic correction uh, is is trivial. It's down to so many places at the decimal, there's no need to consider it. So for example, as we make corrective uh, uh, changes and because that's what we do, we send a spaceship up and uh, you know, part way towards Mars or Jupiter, uh, we make a mid course adjustment because uh, you know, we do the calculations. But I can tell you uh, that uh, when the Jet Propulsion Laboratory makes a mid course adjustment, uh, and the pathway of a spacecraft uh, heading to Saturn, for example, they never bother to throw in a relativistic adjustment. The relativistic adjustment is far too tiny. Likewise, there's no concern that uh, James Clark Maxwell's theories of thermodynamics and electromagnetism are ever gonna be overturned. That's a foundation that we can count on. And uh, yes, science will advance, 
uh, but it's not going to overturn uh, previous science. Likewise, the Big Bang Theory, but I was just writing about this this the past few days. People have been asking me, uh, is it possible uh, that the standard Big Bang creation model uh, could ever be overthrown? And the point I made is there will certainly be refinements of the Big Bang creation model that will come. Uh, but the standard Big Bang creation model is a model that the universe expands from a cosmic beginning that includes the beginning of space and time. It expands under laws of physics that don't change, or one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. Incidentally, all four of those statements are made repeatedly in the Old Testament. Uh, so it uh, wasn't uh, Sir Edmund Hubble uh, that uh, came up with the Big Bang Theory. Uh, it wasn't the uh, Kobe satellite uh, that proved the Big Bang Theory. Uh, rather, it goes back uh, thousands of years to six different authors uh, in the Old Testament. And today we've been able to refine that Big Bang creation model where we say uh, the Big Bang creation model is one where dark energy is a dominant component of the universe. And the second most dominant component is dark matter, matter that does not strongly interact with light. Uh, now, I think that inevitably will be adjusted for the simple reason. We do not yet have the measurements in uh, astronomy to determine the precise nature of dark energy, whether it's governed by a single constant or two or more constants. Likewise, we've yet to identify any more uh, than just a few of the particles uh, that make up dark matter. And so it's inevitable we're going to be refining our Big Bang creation model, but it's gonna be a refinement, it will not be replaced. So what I would say to John Walton and Brent Sandy is 100 years from now, cosmologists will still be uh, sustaining the Big Bang creation model. Uh, there's no risk that we're gonna go back uh, to a steady state model or an oscillating universe model, uh, but refinements will come. Science is always being refined, it's not being changed. I think that's an important point to make. Uh, yes, refinements take place in science, but the fundamentals never change. So the law of gravity is not up for grabs. Electromagnetism is not up for grabs. General relativity is not up for grabs. But yes, as we are able to make uh, more and more precise and comprehensive measurements, we'll discover more about the universe and the laws of physics than we know right now. So science is always advancing. Science is always refining, but science is not being overturned. I think I've said enough about that, but the reason I'm hammering on this, it's just a shock to me uh, to read books by Michael Heiser, Trimper Longman III, uh, you know, uh, John Walton, uh, Brent Sandy. Uh, I could name uh, over a dozen uh, different modern day uh, conservative theologians that are promoting this view. And as I look at all their credentials, None of them have more than a single course in science uh, beyond the high school level. And so even if they were just to read a good book on the history and philosophy of science, I think it would help dispel some of these mistaken notions, but they're getting into the church, which is why I think it's important that we address this issue. And so another point we see from Walton and Brent Sandy, they say scientific investigation, not only are they saying, uh, that, uh, you know, the Bible contains these flaws are actually misunderstanding the power of science. They're saying, and I quote from page 54 and 56 of their book, scientific investigation for its part cannot affirm or deny theological beliefs such as God's role in creation. Science is not a legitimate vehicle for theological truth. And this is why I'm saying these modern day conservative theologians are simply promoting uh, the separate magisteria philosophy of uh, the uh, atheist evolutionary biologist, Stephen Jay Gould. He was the one that 25 years ago came up with this idea. There is no conflict between science and religion because science deals with physical truth. Religion deals uh, with emotions and beliefs and uh, you know, theological, and, and the twain never overlap. Uh, well, I've devoted my whole career to showing that they do overlap. 
that science actually is a vehicle for discovering theological truth. And I would argue this is not just modern day 21st century science speaking, we see it in scripture. Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 18 to 22, uh, which states that every human being was not, was without excuse before God, because God has revealed himself, not only through the words of scripture, he's revealed himself through creation. And it states explicitly in Romans 1, creation is sufficient by itself, not only to reveal the existence of God, but the attributes of God. These are theological truths. And so scientific investigation can affirm and it can deny uh, different theological beliefs. Cosmology is a good example of that. A theological foundation to Hinduism is that we live in a universe that oscillates, a universe that has multiple uh, creations, uh, multiple deaths. It's kind of a pyrrhic thing uh, where you have these Hindu gods bringing the universe into existence and over a period of 4.32 billion years, uh, the universe grows, then it dies, and then it's reincarnated. And so reincarnation, uh, theology and science is built into Hinduism. But guess what? We now have observations in astronomy that definitively uh, demonstrate that it's impossible for the universe to reincarnate. It can't go through the multiple beginnings that Hinduism speaks about. Rather, it's consistent with the Bible speaks about that the universe has a single beginning, uh, not an infinite number of beginnings, one beginning uh, that the universe uh, possesses. And so, uh, and I'm surprised that people like uh, Walton and Brent Sandy, where, by the way, I actually had a face to face conversation with John Walton say, What do you do with the space time theorems that prove that there's a beginning of space and time? What do you do with the cosmic background radiation that tells us that the universe has a beginning <clears throat> and expands from that beginning? Uh, what do you do with the refutations we have of steady state theory and the oscillating universe? This is scientific investigation taking place right before our 20th and 21st century eyes, demonstrating that science indeed is a legitimate vehicle for theological truth. However, I suspect there's a larger motive here. You've got these theologians who I think are playing, I hate to say this, but it sounds to me a lot like a turf war. Theology is our thing. And we do not want these nosy scientists butting in to theological enterprise. Uh, this is our, you guys do your science, we'll do our theology and don't ever in, <coughs> invade our turf. This is our thing to do. And by the way, I've run into scientists that feel the same way, uh, where they basically are telling the theologians, buzz off. Cosmology is our thing. Uh, don't try to invade our turf. So there are turf wars going on. And moreover, I've also seen turf wars between philosophers and theologians, where the philosophers tell the theologians to butt out, the theologians tell the philosophers to butt out, likewise between philosophers and scientists. This is not surprising. Philosophy, theology, and science, the practitioners there uh, tend to be specialists. They tend to focus on, say, one or two books of the Bible, uh, or one or two uh, scientific disciplines, or one branch of philosophy. And therefore, it's inevitable that these turf wars will break out. On the other hand, I think we need to speak loudly. This is a turf war, and there really is, from a biblical perspective, uh, a mandate <laughs> to break down that turf war and actually get theologians and scientists collaborating and also invite the philosophers to come in and collaborate with us. Uh, this is the whole point of dual revelation. God has revealed himself through these two vehicles, the book of nature and the book of scripture. This is a mandate for collaboration. As I said before in this class, if you look at Psalm 19, it's basically telling us Every follower of Jesus Christ needs to be a theologian. We're all commanded to study God's word and to learn from God's word. Likewise, we're all commanded to be scientists and learn from God's book of nature, what he's got to communicate to us. And I don't like the word command because science is fun. Theology is fun. God doesn't want us to miss out. 
He does not want us to so hyper specialize, we lose out and everything that he's revealed. And again, I think this is the principle of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is an opportunity, one day out of seven, uh, where we step back from our specialized occupations and begin to have uh, that big picture view of what God is doing in both the realm of nature and the book of scripture. You know, I've often come under criticism from some people in our church and in the seminaries where I teach saying, why are you bringing all the science in? It's part of God's revelation. And therefore, I think it's appropriate to be dealing with these subjects, even on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is not just for the study of the book of scripture. It's also for the study of the book of nature and to show how they overlap. Okay, I'll give you another quote here. Everyone believed that there are waters above. Everyone believed that the earth was round. Almost every one of the books I'm seeing, I've got over a dozen books now, written by modern day conservative Bible believing theologians. They all claim to believe in biblical inerrancy, but it's biblical inerrancy as they define it. Uh, but they're unanimous in claiming that everyone in the ancient world, everyone of, in the Israelite community and the people around the Israelites believe that there are waters above, liquid waters above uh, that were situated uh, over a metal or a solid dome uh, over a flat earth. And uh, by the way, uh, I found something on the web. And this is something that uh, is made available for free. You don't have to buy it. You can download it. You can print it. And the title is The Myth of a Solid Heavenly Dome. Another look at the Hebrew rakai. And we're going to go into what this Hebrew word that's translated expanse or vault in some Bible translations. So you can get this uh, online. Uh, it's about a 30 page of paper. It's actually a chapter out of a lengthy book. Uh, and by the way, the entire book is available for free online. You don't have to buy it. You can get the whole book. And uh, this was a book put out by a team of uh, theologians. Uh, many of them were Seventh-day Adventist theologians. Uh, some of these are individuals I've actually uh, met. Uh, but uh, the second chapter in the book is titled The Myth of the Solid Heavenly Dome, Another Look. Uh, at the Hebrew Rakei. But what we're going to do is actually spend some time looking where did this idea come from that the ancients believed that the earth was flat and there was a disk about it. And, uh, but this is being repeated over and over again. And I'll tell you, the bottom line is there is no foundation, historical foundation, to the fact that uh, people in the ancient Near Eastern genre actually believed this. The origin of the belief, by the way, uh, comes from the 18th and 19th century. Uh, 19th, 18th and 19th century is really the origin of this idea that the ancients believed this. But you can't find it uh, in the ancient Near Eastern literature, other than the fact that, yes, there were a few individuals believed this. Hey, 8% of the American population today believes that the world is flat, that the earth is flat. So we actually got a higher percentage, a much higher percentage of Americans believing the world was flat than people in the ancient Near Eastern genre. And we'll, we'll actually be getting into some of the evidence uh, for that. But another statement I think causes some concern, particularly for those of us who are astronomers, <coughs> they claim that the sun and moon share space with the birds and the ancients had no reason to know any better. In other words, the point that they're making, and you see this all the way back in the writings of Peter Enns and uh, uh, Denton Sparks, is this idea uh, that the sun and the moon and the stars were no farther away from us than the birds that fly in the sky. And so maybe you can go up a mile, a few thousand feet. That's where the sun, moon, and stars are. And uh, I'll be sharing with you some reasons why the ancients knew that that was utterly absurd. They had tools for measuring the distance to the sun, moon, and stars. And those tools told them that the sun, moon, and stars uh, were at extreme distances. Uh, they were able to demonstrate uh, that these bodies uh, had to be more than hundreds. Well, they actually measured the distance of the sun. Uh, they didn't measure it accurately, but they got it roughly correct. And also the distance to the moon. 
uh, they got it to within like plus or minus 30% precision, uh, which is enough to show that they were indeed uh, far away and knew that the stars were even more distant. So we'll get into those uh, tools that uh, they had uh, back there. And they also make the point that the waters above represent an accommodation of old world, old world science. So we're actually saying the old world science, everyone believed that there was a body of water suspended above the earth by some sort of solid dome. Uh, but this article that I'm referring to here, uh, titled The Myth of the Solid Heavenly Dome, basically makes the point that the origin of the statement that everyone believed there was a body of water suspended above the earth by some sort of solid dome, you don't see it until the late 17th century. And it comes up in spades in the 19th century. The early part of the 19th century is when you really see European theologians and American theologians promoting this idea that the ancients believe this. So yeah, it doesn't go back thousands of years. It only goes back a couple of centuries, this idea that they believe this. And this is the picture that you've probably seen in a, a lot of books. In fact, it's actually showing up in some public education uh, textbooks. Uh, this idea uh, that you know the ancients, they all believe the world was flat, uh, that this flat earth floated on a primeval ocean, uh, that there was a solid dome above the earth. And on the inside of the dome, you got the sun, moon, and stars. And then you got this vast body of liquid water that sits above uh, this metal dome. But as I mentioned already, the ancients well understood Archimedes' principle. And the idea that you could suspend this quantity of liquid water coming from the primeval ocean above this metallic dome, they all knew that was scientific nonsense. Uh, they understood uh, how difficult it is to pump water up only a few feet uh, from the Nile and the Tigris and the Euphrates. The idea of pumping it up uh, thousands of feet they knew was utterly absurd. Uh, but they had their stories. And uh, we'll be talking about the fact that yes, uh, there were stories, but people understood these stories to be fantasy. And I shared this a couple of weeks ago, what you see on both atheist websites and Christian websites these days is that this belief in a flat earth with a metal dome above it, uh, where there was all this liquid water above the metal dome, they're claiming it's pervasive in all the ancient cultures of the world. But what is true, you do find it in the fantasy literature in all the cultures of the world, but you don't find it in their scientific literature. Their scientific literature utterly refutes this fantastical idea. But every human uh, society has had their fantasies. After all, today, we've got Star Wars. Uh, you know, whenever a Star Wars movie comes out, People flood the movie theaters. Uh, they, they buy uh, the downloads. Uh, but everybody watching Star Wars understands uh, this is fantasy. This is a story. Uh, if you ever watch any of those Star Wars movies, they're violating the laws of physics uh, several times uh, per minute. And the claim is uh, that the ancient Hebrews uh, believed uh, in this flat dome thing too. But one thing. Uh, that two authors, two theologians wrote in the journal Creation. They said, if you actually dig into the ancient Israelite literature, you cannot find a single image or drawing uh, of the world, of any conception of the world. Now, some claim this proves they didn't uh, care two bits uh, about cosmology. Uh, but again, that can be refuted uh, from a study of the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, Job, uh, and also other texts in the Bible. So, um, and uh, this is a quote uh, from the paper I got here. These are the two authors, uh, Yonker and Davidson. And they said, hey, uh, Fat, I'll be actually going through this paper with you, basically making the point uh, that uh, you can look at ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, uh, Rome, you can look at the early Christian, uh, early church fathers, the Middle Ages, and says so you look at all that literature, you cannot find any evidence uh, that people 
uh, living before the Middle Ages at any time in the Middle Ages uh, ever believed uh, that the world was flat. Matter of fact, you find in the literature uh, pervasive writings stating that the earth was a sphere. And so this was the predominant worldview of the ancient Near Eastern genre, not that it's a flat earth, rather that it's a spherical earth. And so thanks to Yonker and Davidson, they document and cite uh, the ancient uh, literature, making the point that throughout the ancient Near East, throughout the world for a matter of fact, everybody understood that the earth was a sphere. And I'll actually show you just how easy it is for the ancients to prove that the earth is a sphere and not a flat body. Uh, but there were these fantastical myths, these fantasies uh, running around uh, about a flat earth. But what's also interesting, look at those fantasies. They're all written with a political uh, objective. When you look at what the Bible writes, no politics, which you do see in some of these uh, fantastical myths of the ancient world, they're all written uh, to make a political point, uh, to establish a political hierarchy. And uh, But when you actually look at their science, you don't see that that is there. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Uh, you know, Next week, uh, we're actually going to look at what Genesis 1 states and actually address this issue of what we're going to talk about on our role play uh, mm -hmm. for our uh, web meeting. Uh, or our, probably not our, uh, not our webinar, but a web meeting where we get to turn on all our cameras and microphones, mm -hmm. is that uh, this idea that the Bible uh, teaches a metal dome is really quite easy to refute. And so I'm actually going to take you uh, throughout the entire Bible and look at every instance where the word rocky -e is used. Uh, you can do that just by going to a concordance. Uh, but yeah, next week, uh, I'll uh, basically uh, take you through the Bible and we'll look up all the Old Testament places, not that many, uh, where the word is used. But when you look at all those passages, it's clear uh, that there's no mandate, no uh, uh, indication that this word Rocky could ever uh, be valid as a translation of a vault or dome above the earth. But here's the reason why we're addressing it. The new translations and it never happened before in the history of church until 2011. 2011 was the first time an English Bible translation came out where they translated this word Rocky E as a dome or a vault. Never happened before. It's now in three Bibles. And unfortunately, it's in the three best-selling Bibles uh, in the world uh, where they have that new translation. And uh, that's one reason why I'm hanging on to my 1984 uh, new international version. It has the accurate translation of the word Rocky E as opposed to the 2011 uh, new international version, uh, which translates it. And you say, how did this happen? It was 21st century theologians who got on the translation committee and basically said, uh, we're going to quote correct uh, what we see in Genesis and put this uh, translation of Vault in there or dome in there. And, uh, and moreover, what I think is really a problem, they actually got rid of uh, all the 1984 editions. You cannot buy a new 1984 edition of the new international version. All you can get is a new one and a new one. And incidentally, this isn't the only place in the new international version <coughs> or the new revised standard version uh, where they've taken the traditional translations and have altered them to fit these modern day uh, ideas of uh, theology. I've said enough. I'm going to stop here and then we'll take some questions. And hey, in the questions, I'll address any topic, not necessarily what we've been talking about here. Okay. Okay. We'll take uh, questions until noon and then we'll have our uh, web meeting. All right. Uh, Stephen Lambeau had a follow-up on that question about the Lagrange point. Mm -hmm. Once you are at the Lagrange point, would you be held there hard to get out of Is it hard to get out of there? Okay. When you're at the Lagrange point and mm -hmm. you got a two-body situation, a star on one planet and no other perturbing bodies, 
yeah, it's very stable, stable for many billions of years. And uh, the only way you can get out of the Lagrange point is to input some energy. So one way you can get that energy is say you get a gravitational perturbation from Jupiter, which pushes you out of the Lagrange point. Another way uh, is uh, you ignite a rocket and uh, push the telescope out. And so that's kind of what they're going to be doing with the James Webb telescope. They're going to send it to the Lagrange point, one of the Lagrange points, and they'll use rockets to get it into the right position. But once it's in the Lagrange point, they'll turn the rockets off. Uh, but yeah, you're going to need some outside energy uh, to push the body outside of the Lagrange point. So, hey, when you're in the Lagrange point, you're going to stay there until somebody pushes you out. And that's probably what happened uh, with Thea. Uh, many astronomers believe that Thea was in one of the proto-Earth Lagrange points. Uh, but because there was movement at that time of solar system bodies, that's where you got Jupiter and Saturn, uh, for example, experiencing a grand tech movement that probably destabilized, pushed Thea out of the Grange point and caused a slow movement of Thea uh, towards the proto-Earth. All right, Jeff has a question here. How would you respond to an accommodationist interpretation of Jesus saying, the eye is the light of the body. Yeah, well, I mean, there are figures of speech in scripture. Uh, Jesus also said, I am the door. And I think his audience understood that he was not claiming to be a wooden door. He's basically making a metaphor saying, just like a door can take you from one room to another room, I am the door that can take you from this universe into a new creation. Um, and so uh, I don't see any problem with that. I think it's quite clear when you look at the context, uh, the Bible does use metaphors. It does use figures of speech. Jesus spoke in parables, but his audience always knew it was a parable. It was a story he was telling uh, to make a significant theological point. And so you got the story of the Good Samaritan. Was there a little Good Samaritan where that happened? I think everybody understood that Jesus was telling that story uh, to make a theological point. And likewise, when he says the mustard seed is the smallest of your seeds, uh, a lot of people said, hey, we actually have seeds that are smaller than the mustard seed. Uh, but the context he was making was, hey, of all the seeds that you're familiar with, the mustard seed is the smallest of those seeds. So again, uh, and this is where I think people uh, like Tremper Lawman III and John Walton are making a significant point. We have to take into, uh, we have to consider the context and the genre. Who is Jesus speaking to, when and where? That needs to be taken into account. But my whole point is that can be overdone. Whereas there's so much focus on the genre, you fail to overlook or fail to take into account other communication tools that are being used and other purposes uh, for the communication. Okay. All right, here's one from Kurt Wheeler. He says, I'm a member of Fort Worth Astronomical Society and Timothy Ferris is scheduled to speak at our upcoming monthly meeting. I was curious to know if you ever had any dealings with him. I don't, but I've read Timothy Ferris's books. I mean, uh, he does a good job uh, as a journalist uh, by actually recording some of the dramatic or telling. He's a great storyteller and uh, accurately does tell a story of the drama of many of the amazing discoveries that have been made. Uh, and the books I like the best are the ones he wrote uh, in the late uh, 20th century and early 21st century. So yeah, uh, excellent writer. And uh, what I like about Timothy Ferris, he actually gets to know these astronomers before he writes the books actually attends their meetings and uh, kind of, and by the way, what I love about Timothy Ferris's books, he actually captures the drama of what happens at these astronomical research conferences, you know, watching them engage one another and seeing the debates they have with one another at these meetings and how the debates happen, not just in the talks they give, but particularly what happens at, at the mealtimes as they're walking back and forth uh, to the different lectures. 
So I think it's going to be an entertaining time. Uh, from what I've read in Timothy Ferris's works, I don't think he's a theist. I don't think he's a believer. But hey, that was years ago. I'd be curious as to where he stands now. Okay. Uh, here's one from Doug McComb, our local street preacher. Uh, it's kind of long. Let's see. Uh, I read in an article on LiveScience.com that using a quirk of quantum mechanics, researchers have created a beryllium crystal capable of detecting incredibly weak electromagnetic fields. The researchers created their quantum crystals by trapping 150 charged beryllium particles or ions using a system of electrodes and magnetic fields that help overcome their natural repulsion for each other. Someone named Anna Marie Ray, an atomic physicist at JILA said all that. A joint institute between national uh, institutes. Yeah, that's a and research okay. institute in Colorado. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, let's see, now then his question, does the work one day uh, be used to detect hypothetical dark matter particles called axions, the article claimed. Do you agree? Second question, how could that work? And are there axion particles in dark matter? Yeah, I mean, uh, there is a growing consensus amongst both astronomers and theoretical physicists that axions may be the most dominant particle that makes up uh, dark matter. And so there's a big quest on to try to find axions. Uh, they're going to be very difficult to find because uh, they're low mass and uh, they do not interact very well with light at all. So it's going to be a challenge to find them. Uh, but this article that Doug is referring to is basically saying maybe we can use uh, electromagnetic bottles, uh, electromagnetic fields that can entrap these particles and uh, with such uh, and actually get to such high energy densities that maybe we can detect axions. And that's similar to projects that are currently going on at the Large Hadron Collider, where they're using the world's most powerful uh, particle accelerator to see if they can detect axions or the decay of axion particles. Uh, and astronomers are involved in this too. Um, and they're actually looking at white dwarf stars. And what they're noticing, like a white dwarf star is a star that has used up all of its nuclear fuel. And because all of its nuclear fuel has been exhausted, the star is in a state of cooling down. A good example would be an ember on an open fire. You know, a piece of wood where all the fuel has been exhausted uh, through the burning of the wood, uh, it becomes an ember. And if you watch the ember, you can see uh, that the light of the ember gradually gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And eventually, it's no longer red or orange, uh, it becomes black, uh, where it's no longer emitting significant light. Same thing's happening with stars. When the stars have exhausted all their nuclear fuel, they're in a process of cooling down. Now, the universe is way too young for any star to completely cool down and become black. There are no black dwarfs in the universe. The universe is not old enough yet to have any star completely cooled down. But astronomers are able to measure the cooling of white dwarf stars. And particularly when they measure the cooling of white dwarf binaries, where you've got two white dwarf stars orbiting around one another, uh, what they've been able to observe, they seem to be cooling faster than what the laws of thermodynamics would predict. And therefore, astronomers have said, maybe the extra cooling we're seeing is axion decay. And so there's a project going on amongst astronomers to actually observe a sufficiently large sample size of white dwarf binaries that they could actually uh, demonstrate that there's excess cooling that would be the signature of axion decay. So uh, there's a race going on right now. The seal will be the first to uh, discover these axions. But yes, many astronomers, in fact, most astronomers and physicists think that's the dominant component of exotic dark matter. But hey, there are 37 other candidate particles. 38 particles are being looked at by astronomers and physicists as candidates. And it could be that all 38 exist, or maybe 20 exist. But yes, uh, many of us are persuaded that of all those 20 or 30, 
uh, axions likely will be the dominant component. Okay. Um, Chris Thompson from Anchorage, do you have any thoughts on the speed of thought, miracles, and divine intervention in the affairs of man? Well, our thoughts uh, are limited uh, by electromagnetism. So you're not able to think faster than the velocity of light. And we're all aware, for example, that uh, it takes time for your brain to send a signal to your hand to move it away from a hot stove. Uh, but it's fast, it's a split second. Uh, but the movement is actually slower than the velocity of light, quite a bit slower. And so there's reasons in terms of our physiology uh, why uh, nerve signals, which are electrical signals, don't travel at the speed of light. But that would be a limit. There's no way they could travel faster than the velocity of light. Now, was there something else in that question that I needed to address? No, that was it. Just okay. well, he, dealt, he dealt with thought, miracles, and divine intervention. You know. Well, again, our, our thoughts are going to be limited by the velocity of light. Okay. Are God's thoughts limited? No. He's not subject to the velocity of light, but we are. Okay, here's a question from Esther McCorkle Hoyas. Monday, September 6th is the Jewish New Year 5782. Is also a year when the land rests for a year. Some Orthodox rabbis claim that Messiah will come during a Shemitah year. S-H-E-M-I-T-A-H. They are proclaiming this for this 2021-2022 year. I fear that they will be easily deceived by the future anti-Messiah. Do you think that there are, is any prophetic significance in this coming year? And I know that the date, the dates are not for us to know. We are to know that he, his return is nearer than before. Well, this will not only be the, uh, the, the one time where this happens. Uh, so, uh, you know, yeah, you rest the land every seven years. Uh, there's also the Jubilee, where every 49 years, uh, you have a special celebration. And so, yeah, amongst uh, Jewish theologians, there's this idea that Jesus would come uh, during the Sabbath rest of the agricultural land, or he'll come during a Jubilee year. And so if 2021 to 2022 is not it, hey, add another seven years, add another 49 years, depending on your uh, calculation. And so, uh, but as far as my opinion, is anything significant going to happen prophetically in 2021 and 2022? Um, you know, significant things always happen. So yeah, there will be significant events in history that I predict will take place in the next year. Uh, but that's like predicting uh, that I'm going to cross water at some time in the next year. It's going to happen. Uh, but in terms of any biblical prophecy being fulfilled in 2021 and 2022, um, I don't see anything other than what's already taking place. I mean, you do see prophecies in the book of Ezekiel uh, that uh, with the rebirth of Israel for a second time, Jews from all over the world will return from those nations and settle in the land of Israel. And uh, you know, what's phenomenal is when back in 1948, uh, there was only 600,000 Jews in the land of Israel. And uh, you know, when you had the 1973 uh, Arab-Israeli war, uh, there were just over 3 million Jews in the land of Israel. Today, it's pushing 8 million. So about half the world's Jewish population is now living in the land of Israel. But Ezekiel predicts a time will come when virtually all of them will be living in the land of Israel. So I would say in 2021 and 2022, we're going to see the percentage grow. But I don't see any way that all of them will be there in Israel within the next year. And what's significant about that, according to the prophecies in Ezekiel about the new nation of Israel, the really significant events will not happen until two things happen. 
that um, virtually all the Jews in the world are living in the land of Israel. Uh, the wealth of the land of Israel uh, becomes really uh, significant. Uh, we're on a per capita basis. Israel becomes the wealthiest nation in the world, and that's not yet happened. So until those two things happen, quote, the prophetic clock of the end times uh, cannot get started. So, uh, and I think it's going to take more than a year for those events to take place. But uh, I think what's encouraging in terms of Bible prophecy, uh, what looked like something to be impossible 30 years ago, now is within reach. We are seeing movement towards the fulfillment of both of those prophecies. Uh, Jeff Stucker, uh, what are some alternatives to an accommodationist interpretation of Jesus saying that the eye is the light of the body? Oh, well, I think what Jesus is making the point that the eye is the light of the body. What does the New Testament say about that? And by the way, thanks for bringing that up because I, I missed that point when I was answering the previous question. Look at what the New Testament says about light. John chapter one says, Jesus is the light of the world. And uh, then you have uh, the, the epistle of John, his first epistle where he begins in the first chapter, God is light. But in chapters two, three, and four, he defines what that light is. And it's clear from John one and the first epistle of John, John is referring not to electromagnetic radiation. He's referring to a spiritual light. And he defines it in the first John two, three, and four, that God's light is a combination of a God's life God's love, and God's truth. That's one reason why I often begin prayers for the Paradoxes class by saying, may we receive more of God's love, life, and truth, because a combination of that is the light that God wants to bring into the heart of the world. And basically, Jesus is saying, uh, it's through our eyes that we see not only physical light, we see spiritual light. When we actually they begin to read this book, uh, we see you know, electromagnetic light coming down the page, but as we read the words, as we read the paragraphs, that brings into a heart God's spiritual light. So I think that's the point that Jesus is making. And I think all of his uh, contemporaries, everybody in the audience knew that he was referring to spiritual light. He's basically saying, hey, what you focus on with your physical eyes determines what kind of spiritual light will come into your heart whether it be spiritual darkness uh, because of what you feast your eyes on, or it's going to be spiritual uh, righteousness and good uh, because of what you examine uh, with your eyes. So the eyes is a light into the human heart and likewise our ears. Uh, so, um, and you know, that point is brought out too by Jesus. He talks about how the ears uh, can be a means to hear and respond to spiritual light. Um, like we have one more question. Susan Lambeau has uh, again brought up the Lagrange point. She says, what I am saying is, if we went there, would it be hard to leave? Uh, yeah, it would be hard to leave, Susan, unless you had some energy pushing you out. So without uh, you know, a rocket, uh, without some gravitational perturbation, if you're at the Lagrange point, you're going to be staying there a long, long time. So, but again, this idea that if you're at a Lagrange point in an orbit, uh, it's a stable spot. It's on the assumption you're dealing with a two body problem that you've got one massive body and you've got a smaller body orbiting about that massive body. Uh, then Lagrangian physics tells us that there are certain positions, 60 degrees forward, 60 degrees back, uh, where uh, you can be in a stable orbit. But it's on the assumption that there's no other perturbing forces. You don't have a Jupiter or a Saturn or a Venus uh, that could uh, gravitationally push you away uh, from that Lagrange point. So yeah, if we put you in a spaceship uh, to one of Earth's Lagrange points, you're gonna stay there until something pushes you out of the way or until you 
use a rocket to push yourself out of the way. She, she does ask how much energy. I don't know if she wants to quantify. But... Yeah, you're going to need a lot of energy. Uh, so a jetpack is not going to do it. Uh, you're going to need to expend quite a bit of energy to push yourself out of the Lagrange point. And so the James Webb Space Telescope, for example, does, will not have the rocket fuel on board uh, sufficient uh, to bring it back into Earth orbit. Uh, that would take a lot of energy. And as I mentioned last week, uh, in order to get the James Webb Space Telescope to the Lagrange point, uh, it was necessary that they cut the weight down. And so the James Webb Telescope, as big as it is, is only half the mass of the Hubble Space Telescope. And so that's was part of the design. How can we really strip down the weight so that uh, we can send it a million miles away and get it into the Lagrange point? Uh, yeah, she's uh, asking how much energy, <laughs> but I think you got it here. That sounds pretty yeah, good. Yeah, I can't come up with a number off the top of my head, uh, but uh, for example, you would have to increase the weight of the James Webb telescope uh, probably by a fuel supply at least 50% the mass of the James Webb telescope to be able to successfully get it out of the James, get it out of the Lagrange point, head it back towards Earth, or it could be in orbit about the Earth where you could do a repair mission. That's what it would take. And uh, you know, I'll get my friends at JPL. Hey, we got a lot of JPL engineers here that are part of this class. Uh, maybe we can give that and give them an assignment. So if one of you wants to report back next week and tell us exactly how much energy you would need to make that happen, I'm just ballparking it, but it'd be great to have an exact number. Homework assignment. All right. <laughs> hey, does she want any calories or jewels? You'll have to let us know, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay. We'll make that part of the assignment too. You got to give it to us in jewels and, and, and in ergs. Ergs, yeah. Electric. Uh, okay. Uh, that's it, Hugh. Uh, last okay. question. Well, that's good. Uh, you know, we're, we're at uh, 11.54 right now. So uh, what I'll do is I'll pop up the URL uh, for people who want to join uh, the web meeting, and then we'll go into the web meeting uh, where we'll do our role play. So uh, let me uh, uh, pick up the appropriate. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is the URL that you're going to need to go into our web meeting. And so I'll shut down this webinar. And uh, then all of you can uh, use this URL to get into the web meeting. It's the same URL we've been using for the past several months. So if you got in last week or a month ago or three months ago, same URL. I'll pop this up for those of you that, knew, uh, that want to join us. And once you get into the web meeting, I'll wait a minute or two because I need to move all of you from a waiting room into the actual meeting. But once you're in the meeting, you can turn on your camera, you can turn on your microphone, and you can start introducing yourself to one another. And once we've done all that, then we'll set up the role play. And, you know, you're in a hallway at your office or by the water cool, cooler, and you overhear a conversation. How can anyone possibly believe in a book that states right at the beginning that the world is flat and there's a metal dome about it with a bunch of water above the metal dome? How do you respond? And, uh, hey, I thought it was going to get a lot farther in a teaching where we got into that, but I'd be interested in how you'd respond at this point. And incidentally... I've actually experienced those kinds of conversations and that therefore have had the opportunity to walk up and actually help people uh, pass their misconceptions about Genesis 1. So we'll do that. And uh, that's why it's always good to have a Bible not too far away because uh, I often, what I'll say to people like that, well, you actually have read the Bible. Where did you get that idea from? So that's what we'll do. So uh, let me uh, exit this. And now we'll go, okay, I'm going to end the meeting and those of you can join us. I'll see you in the, uh, uh, I'm going to end the webinar and see you in the web meeting.